With the election of President Barack Obama and now the re-election, the problem of torture has not, as many of us once hoped, simply disappeared, wiped away by sweeping executive orders. Instead, it is now well into a particularly sordid second phase called impunity. Simply put, impunity is the political process of legalizing an illegal act, in this case, torture. To explain how and why this troubling past of the Bush administration is still very much a part of our political present under Obama, uh, <clears throat> and may indeed shape this nation's future as a world power. Let me offer a, a short history of the American experience of torture uh, as an American drama divided into five acts. Discovery, propagation, perfection, <coughs> legalization, and then the act which is the one we're going to focus on most, impunity. Act one, discovery. On April 28, 2004, Americans were stunned when CBS television broadcast those now notorious photographs from Iraq's Abu Ghraib prison showing hooded Iraqis stripped naked while U.S. soldiers stood by smiling. And as this scandal grabbed headlines around the globe, then, De De then Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld uh, uh, insisted that these abuses were perpetrated by, quote, a small number of U.S. military. Uh, the conservative New York Times columnist William Sapphire branded these small number of U.S. military as creeps. But these photos were not snapshots of simple brutality or a breakdown in military discipline. Take, for example, that iconic photo of a hooded Iraqi with electrical wires hanging from his extended arms. This shows not the sadism of those few creeps, but instead the two key trademarks of CIA psychological torture. Now, when you look at it, it's, it's banal. We've seen it so many times. Uh, what are we looking at? Some guy uh, standing in a box with his arms out, he's got some wires. We've been told that he's been told that if he drops his hands, he'll be like, so he's got to hold his arms out, he's got a bag on his head. So he's got a five cent bag on his head, and he's got his arms outstretched. Okay? That action, what you're seeing there, is the result of tens of millions of dollars of research into the most sophisticated techniques of psychological torture. The bag is for sensory deprivation, removal of sight, the arms are outstretched, that's self inflicted pain, or what we call stress positions. <clears throat> In short, this photo is a snapshot of a distinctively American form of torture, psychological torture. Now, viewed historically, the Abu Ghraib prison scandal of 2004 and thereafter is the product of a deeply contradictory U.S. policy toward torture, evident since the start of the Cold War back in the 1950s. Now, back then, publicly, Washington opposed torture and advocated quite forcefully a universal standard for human rights. Manifested in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 and the Geneva Conventions of 1949. As a footnote, we, when we ratified the Geneva Conventions, we put in a reservation saying we reserve the right to execute people for violation of the Geneva Conventions. Okay? We went further than the rest of the world. Simultaneously and secretly, however, the CIA began developing ingenious new torture techniques in contravention of these same diplomatic conventions. From 1950 to 1962, the CIA led a secret research effort to crack the code of human consciousness, a veritable Manhattan project of the mind, with costs that reach at peak a billion dollars a year. Now, while agency drug testing, the exotic techniques, drugs, electroshock, hypnosis, led nowhere, CIA-funded behavioral experiments, rather mundane, uh, were outsourced to major university researchers, and they produced two key findings that were seminal in the CIA's creation of a new doctrine of psychological torture. Uh, discovery number one, sensory deprivation. In the early 1950s, a famed Canadian psychologist named Dr. Donald O. Hebb found that he could induce a state of akin to psychosis in just 48 hours. Now, what had the doctor done? Drugs, hypnosis, electroshock? No, none of the above. Now, for two days, student volunteers at McGill University where Dr. Hebb was chair of psychology, simply sat in a comfortable air-conditioned cubicle, deprived of sensory stimulation by, by sort of glove-like tubes, okay? and then that eyepiece and a goggle that blurred and, uh, and reduced the vision, and then there were uh, 
that goggle had an earpiece on that either blocked all sound or gave them controlled sound. The first reaction from all of those subjected to this, many of them were uh, medical students at McGill University Medical School, were extreme hallucinations, more extreme than, uh, uh, than mescaline, uh, uh, little white men coming out of the side of hill, strings of paper dolls, bizarre, absolutely bizarre kinds of hallucinations. And then they would progress to break down. I interviewed one elderly retired medical doctor um, that I retired from the community, and he described to me, after having been a, a subject in this experiment, he was in a lecture theater, and he started screaming uncontrollably. He had a complete breakdown, and the professor had to clear the theater. Discovery number two, self-inflicted pain. During the 1950s as well, two eminent physicians at Cornell University Medical Center, working for the CIA, found that the Soviet secret police, the KGB, the most devastating torture technique involved not crude physical beatings, but simply forcing the victim to stand for days at a time. While the legs swelled, the skin erupted in separating lesions, the kidney shut down, and hallucinations began, all incredibly painful. After a decade of this secret mind control research in 1963, the CIA codified its findings in a succinct, secret, instructional handbook titled The QBARC Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual. What is QBARC? QBARC is the CIA's cryptonym, its code name for itself. So it's the CIA's Counterintelligence Interrogation Manual. This became the basis for a, a new method of psychological torture disseminated worldwide and within the U.S. intelligence community. Refined through years, in fact decades of practice, the CIA's use of sensory deprivation relies on seemingly banal procedures Heat and cold, light and dark, noise and silence, feast and famine, for a systematic attack on the sensory pathways into the human mind. Act 2, Propagating the Paradigm. After codification in the 1963 Kubark Manual, the CIA spent the next 30 years disseminating these torture techniques within the U.S. intelligence community and worldwide among anti-communist allies across Asia and Latin America. In July 1970, America saw the work of these allies when a young congressional aide named Tom Harkin, now the U.S. Senator from the state of Iowa, took photos of prisoners suffering in South Vietnam's tiger cages that were published in Life magazine and did much to discredit the South Vietnamese government and the larger U.S. war effort in support of that government. But once the Cold War ended in 1990, Washington resumed its advocacy of human rights ratifying the UN against, Convention Against Torture in 1994, an agreement that banned the infliction of severe psychological and mental pain. On the surface, by virtue of the ratification and a number of similar acts, the United States had apparently resolved the tension between its anti-torture principles and its torture practices. But when President Clinton sent this UN Convention to Congress for ratification in 1994, he included language drafted six years before by the conservative Reagan administration that contained detailed diplomatic reservations focused on just one word in the 26 printed pages of that UN convention. That word was mental. Instead of the UN's broad language about severe pain or suffering, these American reservations narrowed the standard for psychological torture by requiring prolonged mental harm caused by just four specific acts. Now, first of all, prolonged. That's five seconds. Now, how long was that? Just five seconds. It was short. But it may have seemed long. It may have seemed prolonged. Who's to say? There is no standard for what constitutes prolonged. And harm. What constitutes harm? Uh, an experience that makes you disoriented for an hour, that makes you suffer for a month, that makes you suffer for a lifetime, that does permanent, lasting, irreparable damage. What is harm? There is no standard definition of what constitutes harm. And then, adding to the legal leger de main, uh, the United States said that, what, that this prolonged mental harm, in order to constitute mental torture, must be caused by just four specific acts. Severe physical pain, mind-altering drugs, 
Death threats are threats to harm a third party. This definition was reproduced verbatim down to the semicolons in domestic legislation enacted to give legal force to the UN Convention Against Torture. First in Section 2340 of the U.S. Federal Code, later in the War Crimes Act of 1996 and the Enhanced War Crimes Act of 1997. <clears throat> in effect, by virtue of this legal legerdemain, Washington has split the UN Convention down the middle, barring physical torture, but exempting psychological abuse, particularly those CIA techniques developed at such expense and such care over such a long period of time. Moreover, a year later, in 1995, when the Clinton administration launched its covert campaign against Al-Qaeda, the CIA avoided direct involvement in torture by sending some 70 terror suspects to allied nations notorious for brutal physical tortures, a practice called extraordinary rendition, explicitly banned in the UN Convention under Article 3 of the Convention Against Torture, even the form as ratified by the United States. By failing to repudiate the CIA's use of torture, while adopting a UN Convention that condemned its practice, the United States left this contradiction buried like a political landmine, ready to explode with incredible force just 10 years later in the Apple Gray prison scan. Act 3, Perfection of Psychological Torture. Right after his public address to a shaken nation on September 11, 2001, President Bush turned to his aides once the cameras had been turned off and gave wide secret orders saying, quote, I don't care what the international lawyers say, we are going to kick some ass. As it took off the metaphoric gloves after 9-11, the White House authorized the CIA to build a global network of eight secret prisons in allied nations from Thailand to Poland, and allowed agents to use enhanced interrogation techniques tantamount to torture, in effect, reviving the CIA's psychological methods abandoned since the end of the Cold War. Hence, when the first detainees arrived at Guantanamo, that is Camp X-ray, Guantanamo, January 2002. Uh, the very first, some of the very first detainees arrived. And notice what they're wearing, okay? Apart from the striking orange jumpsuits. They've got thick gloves on. And mind you, if this is Cuba, right? It's, it's hot. It's very hot, all right? So you don't need gloves to keep your fingers warm. Yeah? You're actually sweating inside the gloves. All right, they've got blacked out eye masks or goggles on. Uh, and they've got you know, ear baffles, okay? So they are deprived. It's the same apparatus. An incredible thing. Instead of outsourcing torture to allies, as Washington had done during the Cold War, Bush's policy represented a, a resolution in that contradiction between U.S. anti-torture principle and anti-torture practices, a resolution that, in fact, uh, authorized the CIA that made Americans now dirty their own hands with torture and in fact made torture a policy of the U.S. government. Consequently, in late 2002, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld appointed General Jeffrey Miller to command Guantanamo with a wide latitude for interrogation, turning this military prison into an ad hoc behavioral science laboratory. Under General Miller, Guantanamo's interrogators stiffened the psychological assault by exploring Arab cultural sensitivity, sexuality, gender identity, and fear of dogs. General Miller also formed behavioral science consultation teams of military psychologists who probed each detainee for individual phobias such as fear of dark or attachment to mother. And through this three-phase attack, the Guantanamo perfected the CIA's psychological torture paradigm, uh, producing an assault on the sensory receptors, which were under the old paradigm, cultural identity, and individual psyche. After a visit from the same Guantanamo chief, General Miller, in September of 2003, the U.S. commander for Iraq, General Ricardo Sanchez, issued orders for psychological torture using sensory disorientation, self-inflicted pain, and that recent innovation, cultural humiliation <laughs> through nudity, sexual degradation, and exposure to dogs. It is no accident that Private Lindy England was famously photographed leading an Iraqi detainee leashed like a dog. When CBS television broadcast those Abu Ghraib photos in April 2004, the American public's reaction to this revelation of torture by its forces at Abu Ghraib, and more broadly, was surprisingly muted. Just two months after the release of the Abu Ghraib photos, 35% of all Americans polled still felt torture was acceptable. Why? 
Why would Americans, who are, I believe, a great and generous people, uh, find an inhumane, indeed criminal act, to be an acceptable U.S. policy? The answer, I think, lies in the realm of mass media, in TV, film, press, and even video games. In the years after 9-11, U.S. mass media, through the invisible tendrils that tie media to a modern state, filled screens large and small across America with enticing images of abuse that served in some to normalize torture for millions of Americans. First aired in October 2001, the Fox News Show 24 broadcast 192 episodes over the span of eight seasons, each attracting up to 14 million American viewers and making its lead character, Jack Bauer, a virtual icon for torture. During the first five seasons, there were 67 torture scenes, uh, and each one portrayed Jack Bauer's recourse to torture, that's Jack's knife on the eyeball of a fictional presidential aide, effectively extracting information about the location of poison gas canisters that would kill millions of Los Angelinos, had not the knife to the eyeball uh, 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 worked and extracted the precise location uh, of the canisters in fictional Long Beach departing on a freighter. And each one of those 67 torture scenes showed torture, torture being, you know, stunningly effective and actually, over time, sort of sensually enticing. <clears throat> the temper of these times also made torture a significant theme in a surprising number of big box office feature films. As Casino Royale became a smash hit in 2006 with $600 million in total sales, the highest grossing among the 21 of the James Bond films, millions of Americans sat through the film's big scene, a widescreen homoerotic spectacle of Daniel Craig's Craig stripped naked while the evil Le Chiffre bounds his pounds his genitalia with a heavy knotted rope. This is an earlier torture scene from Goldfinger with Sean Connery. This is from 1964, and that's Goldfinger there, and he's got this laser gun, and he's going to move it down, and it's going to start burning its way through a solid steel sheet, a steel plate, towards, and forgive me, but I guess we're all adults here, towards James Bond's crotch, his ever so sensitive genitalia. And James Bond cleverly manipulates Goldfinger, you know, and by the way, notice our hero is fully clothed, okay? rather elegantly attired in this kind of spy outfit, okay? Uh, and Bond skillfully manipulates Goldfinger. Uh, Goldfinger stops the laser just a fraction of an inch from the ever so sensitive part of the male anatomy, uh, and he escapes from this, this situation of being tortured by the threat of evisceration and impotence. Let's now move on to the next slide. Uh, let's compare this with the scene from Casino Royale with Daniel Craig. Now, first of all, Notice that it complies fully, and I spent some time going through some magazines and websites to determine this, of, of male homoerotic uh, pornography. Uh, Daniel Craig, like all males, would I think probably have body hair, but you'll notice that he's shaved and he's shining and buff. Okay? It's, 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 it's a beautiful body. I mean, it is. He's a real, that's he's a hunk. Okay? And, and, and the scene of him having his genitalia smashed by this knotted rope takes us into this very dark realm of sadomasochistic experience, okay? Uh, and, and it's interesting in this film, okay, Daniel Craig is, is just getting beaten mercilessly, all right, by the evil de Chiffre, and he, he's, he can't get himself out of it. Indeed, the whole scene is set. It's in this concrete basement with the downlighting to give you a sense of how powerless Daniel Craig, how powerless is that most cunning of secret agents, James Bond, before the power of the torture. And, and actually, how does he get out of it? Well, another bad guy breaks in, who's got a score to settle with Shashifra, kills him, and Daniel Craig kind of gets away, haplessly, through no skill of his own. The power of torture, the sensuality of torture, the appeal of torture. We're deep into the torture experience. Even an anomaly religious film, The Passion of the Christ, uh, director Mel Gibson spun 11 words in, about Christ flogging in the Gospels. I counted them. Things like, Pilate ordered Christ to be flogged. That's it, okay? That becomes eight minutes of the film's 125 minutes 
with Roman centurions beating Christ's torso into a suffering mash of lesions. From the widescreen, the torture theme began appearing in a surprising number of best-selling video games. In the 2008 edition of the World of Warcraft, which sold a record of 2,800,000 copies on day one of its release, the player must use a neural needler, which inflicts incredible pain upon uh, the target and thereby extracts accurate information from a bound sorcerer. In other words, to play the World of Warcraft, you know, the three million kids, times how many other kids are playing, uh, you've got to torture in order to advance in the game. It's inbuilt into the mechanics of the game. The sum of this media transformed torture within the rhetoric of American politics from an abomination into an acceptable public policy option. Between 2005 and 2012, the percentage of Americans who approved of water voting rose from 16% in 2005 to 25% in 2012, while those who disapproved of waterboarding as a method of U.S. interrogation dropped from 82% disapproval back in 2005 to just 55% disapproval in 2012. So, we might ask, this, is this policy which is approved of by 25% uh, of Americans, and uh, which 45% of Americans don't disapprove of, is waterboarding torture. This is from a 1541 French judicial handbook. And if you'll notice, right there at the, underneath the canopy, there is a magistrate, there's a court reporter that's recording the testimony of the victim or the witness, and you can see the witness is bound in a prone position, and the, uh, the handler, I suppose you might call him, has a cloth over the mouth and nose of the victim, and he's pouring cold water under the cloth. And notice the caption from a 1541 French judicial handbook. Tortura Gallica Ordinaria, okay? Standard French torture. Now, I submit, back in the 16th century, they knew what was torture, all right? I think we can give them credit in the 16th century for having that knowledge, that experience. And, you know, there it is, standard French torture. Waterboarding, standard French torture. In, uh, when Porter Goss was recently director of the U.S. Intelligence Agency, he called waterboarding standard interrogation technique. Clearly, the influence of all this media saturation has persisted in the present, transforming standard French torture to tour like Galica Ornaria into an acceptable public policy option. Act 4, the legalization of psychological torture. After the Supreme Court's Hamdan decision of June 2006 challenged President Bush's interrogation policy, Vice President Cheney led Republican partisans in drafting legislation that sailed through Congress without amendment or alteration to become the Military Commission's Law 2006, the law of this land. Above all, this law protected the CIA's use of psychological torture by repeating verbatim the exculpatory language still embedded in those diplomatic reservations and in Section 2340 of the Federal Code that limits the definition of psychological torture to those four specific acts, severe pain, mind-altering drugs, death threats, or threats against another. Everything else, including the psychological torture techniques the CIA had refined over the past 40 years, was not torture. And in the first step towards impunity, this legislation granted all CIA interrogators who had used these methods an immunity dating all the way back to 1997. Now, why did we go back to 1997? Why not just September 11, 2001? Because 1997 is the date in which the Enhanced War Crimes Act okay, came into effect and it was possible under the war, that act to, con to construe the action of some CIA interrogators as torture. So it's a blanket immunity dating back to the time when that act came into effect. Act 5, impunity in America. Now whether in England, France, Indonesia, the Philippines, or the United States, the process of impunity usually passes through some similar stages. Step 1, blame the bad apples. For a year after the Apple Grave expose, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld uh, in 2004-2005 blamed the bad apples by claiming, as I said earlier, that the abuse was perpetrated by a small number of U.S. military. Step number two, invoke national security. In the months following Obama's inauguration, Republicans took us deep into the second stage of impunity with Dick Cheney's statements that the CIA's methods had prevented thousands of deaths, sometimes he says tens of thousands of deaths, sometimes it's hundreds of thousands of American deaths. And he says it loud and long, 
on Fox television and every other media outlet uh, will give them an audience. This was a claim that the Obama administration has not disputed or refuted. Step number three, appeal to national unity. So we admit, okay, maybe it wasn't the bad apples, okay? And, you know, maybe you can debate the, whether or not hundreds of thousands of American lives were saved by these techniques, but whatever it might be in the past, the past is the past, we move forward as Americans unified together. In his attempt to preempt a political backlash to his earlier reforms, President Obama brought us to the third stage of impunity when he visited CIA headquarters at Langley, Virginia in April 2009 to promise there would be no prosecution, saying, quote, we made some mistakes, but it's time to acknowledge them and then move forward. Step number four, political counterattack. By failing to investigate past human rights abuse, President Obama seems inadvertently to have created a political opening for the fourth stage of, in the process of impunity. A political counterattack from perpetrators and the powerful who authorized their actions, seeking not just exoneration, but vindication. For over two years, Dick Cheney and his daughter Liz Cheney made dozens of television appearances claiming, as I said, that these enhanced techniques have saved so many lives. Ironically, Obama's successful assassination of Osama bin Laden uh, in May 2011 provided an opening for the right, for the neoconservatives and the, uh, the powerful in the Bush administration uh, to complete the process of impunity. Forming an a cappella media chorus, former Bush administration officials appeared on television to claim, without any factual basis, that it was the enhanced techniques used in 2002 and 2003 and 2004 that somehow led us to Osama bin Laden in 2011. Uh, there, of course, is no basis for that claim, but nonetheless, it was good political theater. And within weeks, Attorney General Eric Holder announced an end to any investigation of harsh GI interrogation. The fifth and final stage is one that we're going through right now. We're not aware of it, but it is. It's the writing or the rewriting of the past to seal the debate for all times and affirm that these techniques were necessary to have saved American lives. On the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks uh, in September 2011, we reached the fifth and final step towards impunity, the writing of an historical narrative to justify the recourse to torture. In memoirs published on August 30, 2011, former Vice President Dick Cheney defended the CIA's use of enhanced interrogation techniques by focusing on the interrogation of the first Al-Qaeda, supposed Al-Qaeda uh, member, uh, a man named Abu Zubaydah, uh, to be the, the, the victim of these techniques. <clears throat> and Cheney claimed that the use of enhanced interrogation, particularly waterboarding, turned this hardened Al-Qaeda terrorist, which you may or may not be, but let's leave that aside for now, uh, uh, turned this hardened Al-Qaeda terrorist into a fount of information and he started giving out names, etc., etc. But two weeks later, just two weeks after Cheney published his memoirs, a former FBI counter-terror agent named Ali Sufan, fluent in Arabic, published his memoirs describing how he used his deep knowledge of, of, of Al-Qaeda's network for non-coercive interrogation of Abu Zubaydah that quickly gained what Ali Sufan called important actionable intelligence, and the CIA's course of techniques uh, uh, failed repeatedly. Now, what happened was is that after Abu Zubaydah was captured and put into a hospital, we believe in Thailand, okay, Ali Sufan and his FBI counter-terror team were sent in to start the interrogation. And very quickly, uh, 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 according to his own account, Ali Sufan walked into the room, sat down, and said to Abu Zubaydah in Arabic, how about I call you Hani? That was his nickname given to him by his mother. Uh, and it was his boyhood nickname. And so, yeah, they started off on that level of rapport. And Abu Zubaydah gave, according to Al Sufan, some very useful information, uh, giving up the, the code name of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and things like that. When that information reached CIA headquarters, George Tennant was reportedly delighted at first until he was told that it was actually an FBI team, not a CIA team, that had extracted the information. He pounded the table and ordered the CIA psychologist, a guy named Mitchell, 
who had developed the or revived the enhanced techniques for the CIA, ordered him and a group of CIA on an airplane, flew him out to Bangkok. And so what happened then is the CIA team moved in and they started ramping up the level of coercive interrogation, starting with uh, noise barrage, food deprivation, cold, and that sort of thing. Okay, and uh, Abu Zubaydah climbed up, gave no information. So, so they brought in Ali Sufan, and Ali Sufan said he re-engaged, speak to an Arabic, you know, turned off the noise, let him sleep, you know, gave him some food, established rapport, got more information. They went through four rounds of this, okay? CIA guys get tougher, ramping it up, Abu Zubaydah climbs up, the FBI comes back in, you know, establishes rapport, speaks to an Arabic, turns off the tough techniques. This constitutes as close as we can come to a scientific experiment establishing clearly, definitively, that in a test of between CIA coercive techniques, ramping up all the way to waterboarding, doesn't work, okay? Counterproductive, you get no information. And FBI techniques within the law, establishing empathy, conducting an interrogation in a person's language, okay, building a report, does work. Through this five-step process, impunity has pushed the United States back towards the contradictory human rights policy that it adopted during the Cold War, that is, publicly condemning torture by covertly outsourcing the abuse to allied governments such as Afghanistan, Iraq, Egypt, Morocco, Somalia, Uzbekistan. But in an age of globalization and universal jurisdiction, even perfect impunity within one nation's borders has become imperfect, producing a succession of investigations that are eroding the CIA's sub rosa alliances with European security services and which may, over time, force the United States into compliance with the UN Convention. Mm -hmm. Setting aside long-standing ties to the United States, British commissions, Italian courts, the German press, Spanish magistrates, and the European Parliament have been aggressive in their investigation of excesses under the war on terror. In May of 2009, a court in Milan, Italy, conducted, convicted 22 American CIA agents and a U.S. Air Force colonel, colonel for the 2003 kidnapping and rendition of an Egyptian exile named Abu Omar, uh, sending him to Cairo for brutal physical torture. And just last month, uh, no, uh, two months ago now, in September of this year, Italy's Supreme Court, the Court of Castation, confirmed the conviction of these 22 agents, clearing the way for their possible extradition, and further ordered trials for five Italian Secret Service agents, including the head of Italy's military intelligence, one of the country's top security officers, who were implicated in this rendition and abduction. One by one, European investigations have uncovered the location of the CIA's secret prisons in Lithuania, Romania, and most recently Poland, resulting in the indictment of Poland's former top security chief for human rights violations, an exemplary prosecution that will no doubt discourage further cooperation with U.S. renditions. And in February of last year, former President George W. Bush canceled a trip to Switzerland after hearing that human rights groups were planning to present evidence of his orders for torture, much of it drawn from his own memoirs. Looking back into the more recent past for parallels, Declining imperial powers, Britain, France, and now America, resort to brutal torture that only serves to accelerate the very decline they are desperately trying to avoid or prevent. Let's look first at the case of the torture in Britain's end of empire. In the violent eclipse of the British Empire after World War II, <clears throat> torture techniques developed in conjunction with the CIA, uh, said one British official inquiry, played an important role in counterinsurgency operations in the British Cameroons in 1960-61, Brunei in 1963, British Guiana in 1964, Aden in 1964-67, and Borneo, Malaysia in 1965-66. In Kenya, during the Mau Mau revolt of the mid-1950s, British concentration camp interrogators became expert torturers using electric shocks, burnings, near drownings or waterboardings, mutilations and sexual abuse, which leaked to the press, and stiffened opposition, global as well as local, to the colonial order, accelerating the decline of British rule over Kenya. After allegations of cruelty and torture at the British Army Interrogation Center at Aden, amidst an Arab terror campaign in 1966, an official British inquiry suggested strict external supervision of all future British military interrogators. But after 300 bombs erupted across Northern Ireland in early 1971, 
to the British police tortured IRI captives with the, the notorious five techniques involving sentry deprivation and stress positions, which they, by the way, developed in conjunction with the CIA, sparking a bitter debate in Parliament and an expose by the Times of London. The British Home Secretary at first defended the tough tactic, saying, quote, intelligence is of enormous importance in defeating gunmen. But after two royal commissions of inquiry, Prime Minister Edward Heath stood before Parliament in March of 1972 and said, quote, the government have decided that the techniques which the committee examined will not be used in future as an aid to interrogation. Nonetheless, the Irish Republic complained formally to the European Human Rights Commission, which in 1976 completed an 8,000-page report finding, quote, the combined use of the five techniques shows a clear resemblance to those methods of systematic torture which have been known for over the ages, end quote. In 1977, uh, <coughs> Burton's Attorney General was forced to appear chasing before the European Court of Human Rights to give an unqualified undertaking that the five techniques will not, in any circumstances, be reintroduced as an aid to interrogation. Let's look at the other major case uh, of torture's role in the end of empire, uh, that of France in Algeria. In a vain attempt to crush the Algerian anti-colonial revolution with brutal repression, France launched a massive pacification that from 1954 to 1962 resulted in the forcible relocation of two million Algerians, the deaths of 300,000 more, and brutal tortures, particularly waterboarding, of several hundred thousand suspected rebels. The French government convened a commission of inquiry which excused the army's systematic torture of Algerian rebels, saying, quote, the water and electricity methods, that's the water is a reference to waterboarding, are said to produce a shock which is more psychological than physical and therefore do not constitute excessive cruelty. When an urban uprising erupted in Algiers in 1956 and 57, the 10th Paratroop Division employed torture so relentless that over 3,000 of those arrested were killed, bodies dumped in the desert, and shallow graves at dawn. After information about these tortures reached France, French society suffered a serious moral crisis. According to British historian Alastair Horn, who wrote the definitive book on the Algerian War, quote, you might say that the Battle of Algiers was won through torture, but that the war, the Algerian War, was lost. And indeed, Algeria itself was lost to France. Now, just like the French in Algeria, we Americans have slid down torture's slippery slope to find that extrajudicial execution lies in a moral abyss at the bottom. Just as the French conducted 3,000 summary executions of Algerian torture victims to ensure, uh, according to one French general, that the machine of justice not be clogged with cases, so the U.S. total for drone deaths inside Pakistan, 2006 to 2012, has now risen to over 2,600, and after four years of Obama, only one new prisoner has been detained. Although Americans did not object to these assassinations, the drone program has aroused bitter anger inside Pakistan, and is likely, in the view of senior intelligence officials, to do long-term uh, damage to U.S. national interests. As both Britain and France show us so painfully, in a globalizing world, the practice of torture can become both consequence and cause of imperial decline. Absent any searching inquiry and binding reforms, some future torture scandal will likely arise from another iconic dungeon in a dismal, ever-lengthening historical progression. From the tiger cages of South Vietnam to Abu Ghraib prison, Camp X-ray at Guantanamo, and most recently, the hole in Somalia. Next time, with those images of Abu Ghraib prison etched in human memory, the international community may well prove less forgiving. Next time, the damage to America's moral authority as world leader could prove deep and lasting. Thank you.